So what is a web server? I distinctly remember when I was first getting started programming, wondering what kind of computers are used to serve web applications? What like operating system do they run? And how is the hardware different than the gaming PCs that I've built over the years? And as it turns out, as is often the case with all of this stuff where you don't know it's this black box you're trying to unwrap, I was asking the wrong question. From a hardware standpoint, anything with a network connection could be a web server. Your laptop, a Raspberry Pi, a smartphone, if you've ever done that dance where you're trying to configure an Internet of Things device and you have to connect to it over Wi-Fi, that Internet of Things device is running a web server. Once you get connected to it, that's what you're interacting with. You see, a web server, it's not about hardware, though certainly some hardware is better suited to run a large web application at scale. Instead, a web server is really just a piece of software that serves web content. But Serving web content, that's a tad generic. So let's break it down further and define the six things that a web server does in roughly the order in which they happen. So to serve web content, a web server listens on a port for a request sent via a transport protocol and returns a response containing the requested resource. Again, with this list, we're still really abstract. So let's go ahead and take each one of these items one by one for a closer look. So to start, let's focus for a minute on what it means for a web server to listen. Basically, once a web server application starts up, it just sits there, idle, waiting for incoming requests. If no requests come in, then the web server doesn't actually do anything. I think everybody kind of intuitively knows this, but it's important to keep the concept in the front of our minds. To illustrate this, imagine the, the web server is a guy named Jim who works as a customer service representative at a call center. You can reach Jim by dialing 127-000-0001. And like Jim, the web server just sits there waiting for your incoming request. Jim never places an outgoing call, he just waits and listens. Now I happen to have a web server running right now on my local machine. Of course, it's running on the local host IP address of 127.0.0.1. And if we dial that IP address into the browser, you can see this message. Hey, it's Jim, how can I help you? So what exactly is the web server listening to? The answer is a network port provided by the operating system that the web server is running on. Think like Windows, Mac OS. More specifically, the network protocol that we're using provides 65,535 ports that software running on the computer can communicate over. Now, when a web server starts up, it begins listening on one, or if so configured, many of those ports. Going back to the call center example for a minute, let's assume that Jim works at a call center with 65,535 different extensions. It's like a really big facility. And you can reach the call center's main line by dialing 127-000-0001. But to reach the phone on Jim's desk, you have to dial his extension. Let's suppose that dialing extension 8000 will make the phone on Jim's desk ring. Jim's only listening for calls coming in on extension 8000, and if you dial any other extension, then you won't get our boy Jim. So let's go back to our demo for a minute. Earlier, when we dialed the IP address 127.0.0.1, we didn't provide a port. And that's because a web browser automatically sends web requests to either port 80 or port 443, depending on whether we prefix the URL with HTTP or HTTPS. In the demo, I had the web server running on port 80 using an unencrypted HTTP connection. So there was no need to specify a port as the web browser automatically routed our HTTP request to port 80 by default. But let's stop the web server and start it again on port 8000. Now, if we reload the page, you can see we get an error that this site can't be reached as the IP address refused to connect. And that's because there's no longer a web server listening on port 80 on our local host. We can tell the browser that we want our request sent to port 8000 instead by appending the IP address with a colon and then adding the port number. Now you can see since we've specified the right port to communicate with our server, we've once again reached Jim. Now, just like you could have multiple people working at a call center, each listening for incoming calls on a different extension, so too can you have multiple web servers running on one machine. Let's suppose Jim has a colleague named Jane who can be reached by dialing extension 8001. If you dial extension 8001, you'll hear Jane speaking, but if you dial extension 8000, you get, hey, it's Jim, how can I help you? Let's illustrate this by starting a second web server over on port 8001. Sure enough, if you navigate to port 8001, you see the message from Jane, but if you switch back to port 8000, then you get the message from Jim. The point is that one single computer can have many web servers or other networking services running at the same time. And just like we have to dial the correct extension to reach Jim at his desk, so too must we send our request to the correct port in order to reach the desired web server. Speaking of sending a request, let's take a closer look at what exactly sending a request to a web server means. See, web servers and web clients, like your Chrome, Firefox, whatever, communicate via the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP. And you can think of this as the language that the web server and the web client use. But what does HTTP actually look like? For me, this was the most interesting part of researching this video because of the misconceptions I had about what HTTP actually is. 
Now, when they say hypertext transfer protocol, they literally mean text. Like HTTP is just a web browser and a web server sending raw human readable text files back and forth. And I'm sure I'll get comments pointing out that HTTP version two and beyond converts the text to a binary before sending, but the point still stands. HTTP is based on text. And I don't know why I thought it was more complicated than that. Well, I kind of do. And we'll cover that when we look at the transport layer later on. But we are talking about the application layer for now. And HTTP is really, really simple. Let's open up this text file here containing an example HTTP request and have a look. That's it. That's a valid request in the HTTP language. So breaking the request down, the data is separated into three blocks. The first line is the start line, which contains the request method, which is Git in this case, the request target, which is the specific web page or resource we're requesting. Here you can imagine we're looking up an order on an e-commerce website. And finally, the HTTP version, which in the case of this request is version 1.1. Now the next block is made up of every subsequent line up until the first line break we encounter. These lines contain the headers of our request as defined as key value pairs. Here we just have two, host, which is the IP and port we're attempting to send the request to, and the user agent, which is the header that tells the web server what type of browser we're using. This can be useful so the web server might know to serve you mobile content in case you're accessing on a mobile device. Finally, the third block is made up of an optional body, which begins after that first line break at the end of our header block. And since the request we're looking at is a Git request, we actually don't have a body. But suppose if the web server accepted a form submission to look up order status instead. In that case, the post request, using the post request method, might include a body that looks like this. Here we've added a body with the name of the form input where we entered our order ID and the value of that input, one, two, three in this case. Note that we also changed our request target to be just orders since we're providing the order ID in the body instead of the URL. We also added a couple of new headers, one content type, which tells the web server how the data in our body is encoded, and a content length header telling the web server the size of the body. And that's it. I've seen HTTP requests represented this way before, but like I always thought it was some kind of shorthand or human-friendly representation of what was going on under the hood. I didn't realize I was looking at the HTTP protocol itself. Basically, sending the contents of that file to the IP address on our web server using a transport protocol is literally the same thing as typing the web server's IP address, port, and target resource into the browser. And that's because HTTP is what's considered to be an application layer protocol. It's like the language that the web servers and the clients speak. If any other application protocol other than HTTP is sent to our web server, it won't know how to handle it. Let's go back to Jim and Jane for a minute to kind of clarify this idea. Imagine that Jim, who if you recall is available at extension 8000, only speaks French. Meanwhile, let's imagine Jane, who again is available at extension 8001, only speaks German. If you as a German speaker dial extension 8000, Jim won't have any idea what you're saying because he only speaks French. He won't even be able to help you with your request. He won't know that you're even making a request. Let's illustrate this point by starting Jim's web server again on port 8000, but instead of starting Jane's web server on port 8001, we'll start an FTP server on port 8001 instead. Now FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol, and as the name suggests, FTP servers were typically used to transfer files in the dark ages before you had services like Dropbox. Now if you start an FTP server, it begins listening for requests sent in the File Transfer Protocol, which is a different language than the hypertext transfer protocol that web servers and web browsers speak. Now that our FTP server is up and running on port 8001, let's go ahead and navigate our browser to that port on our local host, and we can see that we get this error message. This page isn't working. 127.0.0.1 sent an invalid response, error, invalid HTTP response. Now basically what happened is the web browser sent an HTTP request to the FTP server, and then the FTP server didn't understand the request and returned a response indicating as much in the FTP language, which our browser that only speaks HTTP didn't understand either, and thus our browser is giving us this invalid HTTP response error. So now we know that HTTP is the language web browsers and web servers speak, but how is the HTTP request actually being sent to the web server? And I've kind of intentionally glossed over this until now while we've looked at what a valid HTTP request looks like, but we have to send it to the web server somehow. You see, HTTP and FTP are what's known as application layer protocols, meaning they both run on top of an underlying communications or transport layer protocol. Let's go back to Jim and Jane for a second. Think about how they speak different languages, French and German, in our latest hypothetical, but both of their voices are carried over the telephone line. German and French are the application protocol, like HTTP and FTP, but the phone line that's carrying their voice, that's the transport layer, which in the web server world is the transmission control protocol or TCP. Now I'm not gonna get too deep into the inner workings of TCP. It's really beyond 
anything you need to know to get started with building web applications, but just know that TCP at a very simple level breaks data up into packets. Then using handshake and confirmations, it ensures that every packet is successfully received by the recipient and the recipient knows the order of each packet for reassembly. Now that we know how a request is sent to the web server, the next thing that happens is that the web server returns a response. Again, just like our browser sent our request in the HTTP language, so too does the web server return an HTTP based response. Now, just like our request, an HTTP response is just text data, again, separated into the same three blocks. Again, we have the start line, which for a response is sometimes referred to as the status line. It contains our HTTP version and an HTTP status code. Here, the response contains a status code 200, which is kind of the generic response for a successful HTTP request. I'm pretty sure I could easily do a 20 minute video just on HTTP status code. So make sure that you subscribe if you're interested in seeing that video. But back to the request, Below that first line, just like in our HTTP request, we have multiple lines of headers defined again as key value pairs. And just like the request, again, headers are enumerated beginning on line two and are bounded by the first line break that we encounter. One of the important headers in this example response is the content type, which here is text slash HTML, which lets our browser know to expect a text file, text content, and that the text content will be HTML, hypertext markup language, AKA a web page in the body of the response. And moving down to the body, sure enough, as promised by our content type header, our body contains HTML content. Here the HTML, just a simple header tag containing the text, hello world. Now, if this were an API response, the content type might instead say application JSON, in which case the response body would contain some JSON data for our application to consume. And taking it one step further, if the resource we were requesting was an image, the content type might be image slash JPEG, and the body would contain the binary contents of an image file. The main takeaway here is that the content returned by a web server is not limited to just web pages. The body of an HTTP response can contain all kinds of things like images and PDF documents and JavaScript code or web fonts. In fact, the video you're watching right now was returned piecemeal in bodies of a bunch of HTTP responses sent by YouTube's web servers to the web browser or your YouTube app. All right, now this kind of transitions us to the last piece of what a web server does. Now we've looked at the HTTP response in the abstract, but let's talk a bit about how a web server decides what to respond with. And I mean that in the practical sense. If I request an image resource and the web server returns it, where's that web server getting the image from? How do we actually set this up in the real world? Determining which resource to return is often referred to as routing, which is really just the practice of connecting a request with the requested resource, the content that's being requested. And for our purposes, you know, it's helpful to think about routing as being separated into two distinct categories. There's static routing, and then there's dynamic routing. Now, static routing is just the web server serving actual files out of a folder. Just like you have a folder on your desktop that you can navigate to and open various files. You can open an image of a cat, you could open a text file. Similarly, you can point a web server to a directory on the file system and tell the web server to return anything that's requested. In fact, let's do that now. We'll open this folder and as you can see, I've got an image file called cat.jpg, which as you might've guessed, just a picture of a cat and two HTML files, index.html and hello.html. And if we take a look at those files, they're very simple HTML files that just contain their respective file names in an H1 tag. So let's go ahead and start up a web server listening on port 8000 inside of this folder. Now, if we navigate to 127.0.0.1 slash cat.jpg, our web server returns the image of the cat. And if we navigate to the root at 127.0.0.1, we get the default index.html files contents. And finally, if we add a slash hello.html to the root, then we get the hello.html contents. And if we navigate to somewhere that doesn't exist in the target folder, then we get a 404 status for file not found. And that's because the file does not exist on the web server. Now static HTML websites like this, they can be really cheap and performant to host since they require very little resources. A static website, the web server is just taking a file that already exists, returning the contents in the body of the response, something that web servers are highly optimized for. And to that end, you can host static sites completely free using something like GitHub Pages, or mostly free with an Amazon S3 bucket, and handle huge spikes in traffic, hundreds of thousands of visitors, in case one of your blog posts makes it to the front page of Hacker News or Reddit, without any slowness or downtime for only a few cents a month. But what about situations where the content that exists at a particular resource changes dynamically? Think about a My Profile type page that changes depending on who the logged in user is, or Imagine an e-commerce web page where you can check your order status. 
Surely you wouldn't generate a static HTML page for every single order in your system and then have to switch out those pages whenever an order status changes from processing to ship to delivered. Of course not. Instead, you'd save that info to a database and serve the contents of that database dynamically. In practice, this usually means configuring your web server to route all requests to a single file or executable, which serves as an entry point for your web application. And that web application could be created using programming languages like JavaScript, PHP, Python, Ruby. And it would evaluate the HTTP request and then dynamically prepare a response depending on the requested resource. Opening up the HTTP request we looked at before, we see it's requesting the resource for order ID 123. And if you sent that to a web application, it would search the database for order 123 and return the status. Now I happen to have a very simple example of a dynamic website that does exactly that. Okay, so now we're in this dynamic folder and I'm gonna start a web server on port 8000. And if we navigate over and we go to localhost 8000 orders and we'll check order ID of one, you can see that it comes back, says order one's been delivered and gives us a tracking number. Let's go ahead and check the status of order two. We can see that order two has been shipped and again, it provides us with the tracking number. One more time, let's go ahead and check a order status of order three. We can see that it's processing and we don't have a tracking number yet. Let's see if there's an order status for four. We check order status for four and it's the same, processing and there is no tracking number. Let's go ahead and check and see if there's an order status for five. Here we get this page cannot be found, an error of 404 was given. So that means there is no order ID number five in our system here. Let's go ahead and jump into the code and see how I set this up. Now I wanted to keep this as simple as possible so you can see this whole dynamic website consists of just a PHP file. It's not importing any libraries at all, no composer files, it's just raw PHP standard library. And you can see that the entire dynamic web application is only 45 lines long. And we also have a SQLite database. And if we jump into the contents of that real quick, you can see that it has one table. And in that table, there's columns of ID, status, and tracking number. So let's jump into this index.php and see how it's dynamically routing our request in order to return our order status. We first are getting our order ID from the route. Here we're using this parse URL helper in order to get the path out of that request URI. And then we're passing it to this regex method, which basically says look for, or this regex pattern says look for orders followed by a slash and then any digit. And then it takes that regex pattern and it does this prereqs match. And if no matches are found, then it returns this not found function or calls this not found function that sets the header to 404 and then just exits right there. But if this path variable does match this regex, so it's like order slash one or order slash two, then it returns that match as the order ID. So you basically get this integer back. You can see it's saying return an integer from this function and that gets stored into this order ID variable. That order ID then gets passed to our get order status from database function. And we can see how that works down here. Basically, it takes that order ID as a property. It creates a new connection to our SQLite database. Then it creates this SQL statement that says select all from orders where ID equals question mark. Then it binds the order ID. And then here it fetches the first result as a associative array, stores it in this result variable. So if the order ID is not found, this result variable is null. And then again, it returns this not found function or calls this not found function that sets the response status code to 404 and then exits. But if a request is found, it's being returned as an associative array. So that's gonna contain the ID, the status and the tracking number if it's not null. And it's gonna return all that back up here and store it in the order details variable. Finally, we call the print HTML function and we pass it that order details array that we got back from the database. And if we scroll down to the print HTML function, you can see it takes that order, those order details, that array of order details, and it just says print, and it defines basic hypertext markup language. You've got the opening HTML tag, the body tag, and then you've got an H1 tag where you're reaching in and getting the order ID and the order status, and then you're getting the tracking number and returning it right here. So again, going back, if we go to orders like one, it's reaching into the database, getting the content for order number one and returning it to the user. So that's a really high level overview of what a web server does. As always with this channel, I'm just trying to introduce you to these concepts. So when you encounter them later, you have enough familiarity to Google your way to a better understanding, something that all software developers do. If you enjoy this kind of content, please consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.